Minima Moralia by Theodore Adorno. This is the dedication. The melancholy science from which I make this offering to my friend relates to a realm which is counted since time immemorial as the authentic one of philosophy, but which has, since its transformation into method, fallen prey to intellectual disrespect, sententious caprice, and, in the end, forgetfulness, the teaching of the good life. What philosophy once called life has turned into the sphere of the private and then merely of consumption, which is dragged along as an addendum of the material production process without autonomy and without its own substance. Whoever wishes to experience the truth of immediate life must investigate its alienated form, the objective powers which determine the individual existence into its innermost recesses. To speak immediately of what is immediate is to behave no differently from that novelist who adorns their marionettes with the imitations of the passions of yesteryear like cheap jewelry and who sets persons in motion who are nothing other than inventory pieces of machinery as if they could still act as subjects and as if something really depended on their actions. The gaze at life has passed over into ideology which conceals the fact that it no longer exists. But the relationship of life and production, which the latter degrades in reality into an ephemeral appearance of the former, is completely absurd. Means and ends are interchanged. The intuition of this ludicrous quid pro quo has not been totally expunged from life. The reduced and degraded essence bristles tenaciously against its ensorcelment in the facade. The change of the relations of production itself depends more than ever on what befalls the sphere of consumption, the mere reflection form of production in the caricature of true life, in the consciousness and unconsciousness of individuals. Only by virtue of opposition to production, as something still not totally encompassed by the social order, could human beings introduce a more humane one. If the appearance of life were ever wholly abrogated, which the consumption sphere itself defends with such bad reasons, then the overgrowth of absolute production will triumph. In spite of this, considerations which begin from the subject have as much that is false in them, so much as life becomes appearance. Because, because the overwhelming objectivity of the con contemporary phase of historical movement consists solely of the dissolution of the subject without a new one appearing in its stead individual experience necessarily relies on the old subject the historically condemned one which is still for itself but no longer in itself it thinks of its autonomy as still secure but the nullity which the con concentration camps demonstrated to subjects already overtakes the form of subjectivity itself. Something sentimental and anachronistic clings to the subjective consideration, no matter how critically sharpened against itself. Something of the lament about the way of the world, which is not to be rejected for the sake of its good intentions, but because the, because the lamenting subject threatens to harden in its being just so, and thereby to fulfill once again the law of the way of the world. The fidelity to one's own state of consciousness and experience is for forever in temptation of falling into infidelity by denying the insight which reaches beyond the individuated and which calls the latter's substance by name. Thus argued Hegel, whose method schooled that of minima moralia against the mere being for itself of subjectivity on all its levels. Dialectical theory, averse to everything which is singular, cannot permit aphorisms to be valid as such. In the best of cases, they may be tolerated, in the words of the preface of the phenomenology of spirit, as conversation. The latter's time, however, is over. Nevertheless, the book does not forget the totality claim of the system, which, is, which does not wish anyone to escape it, any more than the rebellion against the latter. Hegel does not pay heed to the subject in accordance with the requirement, which he otherwise passionately defends, 
that of being in the matter and not always beyond it instead of entering into the imminent content of the matter. If the subject is disappearing today, aphorisms take on the weighty responsibility of considering that which is disappearing itself as essential. They insist in opposition to Hegel's procedure and nevertheless in concordance with his thought on negativity. The life of the spirit wins its truth only by finding itself in what is absolutely torn apart. It is not this power as the positive, which looks away from the negative, as when we say of something that it is nothing or wrong. And now, done with that, pass over from there to something else. Rather, it is this power only when it stares the negative in the face, tarrying on it. The dismissive gesture with which Hegel, in contradiction to his own insight, constantly runs roughshod over the individual, derives paradoxically enough from his necessary bias for liberalistic thought. The conception of a totality harmonious throughout all its antagonisms compels him to rank individuation, however many times he designates it as the driving moment of the process, as something lesser in the construction of the whole. That in prehistory the objective tendency asserts itself over the head of human beings, indeed by virtue of the annihilation of the individual, without the reconciliation implied by the concept of the generality, and the particular ever being historically achieved, this is distorted in Hegel. With lofty iciness he opts once more for the liquidation of the particular. Nowhere does he doubt the primacy of the whole. The more dubious the transition from the reflecting singularization to the glorified totality remains, as much in history as in Hegelian logic, the more enthusiastically philosophy clings as justification of the existent to the victorious motorcade of the objective tendency. The development of the social principle of individuation into the victory of fatality already gives it occasion enough. Since Hegel hypostasizes bourgeois society as much as its founding category, the individuated, he cannot truly carry out the dialectic between the two. Admittedly, he assures us, assures us with classical economics that the totality produces and reproduces itself out of the interrelation of the antagonistic interests of its members. But he naively regards the individuated as such solely as that which is irreducibly given, which he just dismantled in his theory of cognition. In the individualistic society, however, the generality is realized not only through the interplay of individuals, rather that the society is essentially the substance of the individuated. That is why social analysis can garner incomparably more from individual experience than Hegel conceded. While conversely, the great historical categories, after all that has been perpetrated with them in the meantime, are no longer above suspicion of fraud. In the 150 years which have passed since Hegel's conception, something of the force of protest has passed over again into the individuated. Compared with the paterfamilial scantiness, which characterizes its treatment in Hegel, it is one as much richness, differentiation, and energy as it has, on the other hand, been weakened and hollowed out by the socialization of society. In the epoch of its disassembly, the experience of the individuated as well as what it encounters contributes once more to a recognition which it had, which it had concealed, so long as it was construed seamless, seamlessly and positively as the ruling category. In view of the totalitarian unison, which broadcasts the elimination of difference as immediately meaningful, a measure of emancipatory social power may have temporarily withdrawn into the sphere of the individual. The critical theory tarries in it. It is not only due to a bad conscience. All this is not to deny what is debatable in such an attempt. I wrote the book for the most part during the war under conditions of contemplation. The violence which drove me into exile simultaneously blocked me from its full recognition. I had not yet admitted to myself the complicity of those who, as if in a magic circle, speak at all of what is individual, in view of the unspeakable things which collectively occurred. Each of the three parts starts out from the narrowest private realm, that of the intellectual and emigration. After this follow, after this follow considerations of wider social and anthropological scope 
they pertain to psychology, aesthetics, and science in its relationship to the subject. The concluding aphorisms of each section lead thematically too to philosophy. Without claiming to be conclusive and definitive, all of these are intended to mark points of attack or to generate models for future exertions of the concept. The immediate occasion for writing this book was the 50th birthday of Max Horkheimer on February 14, 1945. The composition transpired in a phase in which, due to external circumstances, we had to interrupt our common work. The book wishes to prefer thanks and fidelity by refusing to recognize the interruption. It is testimony to a dialogue interior. There is no motive here. There is no motif here, which does not belong as much to Horkheimer as to the person who found the time for formulation. The specific approach of minima moralia, the attempt to represent moments of a common philosophy from the standpoint of subjective experience, means that the pieces do not entirely measure up to the philosophy, of which they are nevertheless a part. This is expressed as what is loose and non-binding in the form, along with the renunciation of an explicit theoretical context. At the same time, such asceticism should atone for something of the injustice, wherein one continue to work alone on something which can only be completed by both, and from which we shall not desist.